where they're at. I think most of you have a general sense of the, of the lay of the land at the laboratory. Um, so hopefully this will be a good context for you. A little bit about the evolution of it. What's the source of the contamination? What pathway did it take to get there? Yeah, I thought about actually putting a subtitle on this presentation called you know, A Journey Through the Crazy Straw. Um, you'll see in a little bit, I think most of you know what a crazy straw, this does just about everything the crazy straw does but go up. Um, and it's really a very interesting project um, and one that we're actually fairly proud of having been able to resolve given um, the complexity of the setting. Um, and then of course I'll talk a little bit about where we are regulatorily and, and what our plans are for the, for the near future. So basically, um, I'm going to start more or less with the um, punchline, if you will, at the end of the story, and then we'll work our way back into how we get back to this figure again. Um, this is basically um, a footprint of uh, two plumes, if you will, that sit essentially beneath Morton Dead Canyon. Um, sometimes you'll hear, if it confuses you, you'll hear sometimes references to Sandia Canyon, to Morton Dead Canyon. The reason that's a little mixed up is that the, the contaminants, and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, really originated, the chromium originated in Sandia Canyon, it follows the crazy straw, ends up in the deep groundwater environment here, essentially beneath Morton Dad Canyon, and I'll explain how that comes to be. So this is basically the end of the presentation, and I'm going to work backwards and we're going to come uh, forward again and end up here. But this is basically the footprint, this sort of flesh colored uh, area here is the footprint of the chromium contamination above about 50 parts per billion. Uh, which is the Mexico groundwater standard. And this uh, more gray shaded area here is the footprint of a perchlorate uh, uh, plume in the regional groundwater that exceeds the consent order screening level of four parts per billion. So everything inside this shaded area we think probably exceeds four parts per billion. Everything inside this shaded area here um, exceeds 50 parts per billion chromium. So there's uh, just a real quick uh, overview of the, the history of the investigation. Uh, basically, the chromium was discovered, if you will, in a new monitoring well in late 2005, and that triggered uh, a very uh, intensive uh, field campaign, multimedia investigation, starting in 2006 and culminating in what has since become a phase one report um, submitted, I think, in October of 2009. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of details about all the things, uh, um, all the aspects of the investigation, but it's important to know that these investigations aren't just groundwater investigations. When we embark on one of these large water scale, watershed scale investigations, um, we tackle sediment, surface water, the multiple groundwater zones, we look at the biota that are present in the canyon, and, and it's really a, a sort of a multimedia investigation trying to ultimately resolve whether or not there's human health or ecological risk. Uh, where surface exposures could occur, and whether or not there's issues in the groundwater. We don't really run risk assessments, if you will, in the groundwater, but we uh, track the contaminants as far as basically they need to be tracked in whatever medium. Um, the 2009 report led to a series of uh, correspondences between the state and us. They asked us to do some further investigation. We wrote a work plan, began that work in 2010. And just today, uh, the final signatures on the, the Phase 2 report um, that will go to the New Mexico Environment Department on Friday. Um, I'll get into where that's going to go at the end of the presentation. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, here's a portion of the laboratory to kind of orient you. Um, this is the Los Alamos town site. I think probably most of you have been there. Um, the shaded area here is the Sandia Canyon watershed. And you can see that it basically has its head uh, not up in the uplands uh, west of the laboratory, but it actually heads more or less right in the sort of main admin area in TA3. Um, it extends about uh, 10 miles, I believe, all the way to the Rio Grande, not to imply by any means that there's water running all the way. It's just shown here as a drainage. Um, Morton Dad Canyon, just for context, um, isn't shaded on here, but sits just to the south of it, basically running parallel. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that where Sandia Canyon enters the Rio, which sits right here, um, is just below the intake for the Buckman uh, Diversion Project, which sits just, with, if, it, if this map were expanded a little bit, it would sit just about right in there. So does everyone feel reasonably oriented here? So, the truck route so truck route runs right up, so the truck route, you can see it right there, okay. running right up Sandia Canyon, and Main Hill Road's right there. Okay. 
All right, next slide, please. All right, so um, I'm kind of sort of skipping around some of the associated contaminant issues and really trying to stay focused on the issues of perchlorate and chromium here. But don't uh, take this to, to misrepresent that there are associated constituents that are co-located with some of the, uh, with the chromium and perchlorate in some cases. And we can get into those details if you choose, but I'm going to kind of focus really on the chromium here and the, and the perchlorate. So um, as you guys heard, a little bit of a uh, very good discussion um, earlier, uh, the chromium really came from uh, potassium chromate that was applied in the power plant at the head of Sandia Canyon. It was used uh, there as well as everywhere else around the laboratory where you have cooling towers and really across uh, the U.S. and probably internationally back in the years 56 to 72, it was pretty much the standard product for inhibiting corrosion in these kinds of systems. So it's basically your, your, your chrome plate in your system so that you don't create corrosion uh, inside these closed loop um, cooling systems. But it requires a very careful balance of chromium in these systems. Sometimes it can get too enriched. And so every day, um, technicians were out there measuring the chromium concentrations in the system at the power plant. And when it became um, too enriched, they would discharge a little bit in what's sometimes called blowdown. They would discharge a little of it. In this case, they were discharging it directly into Sandia Canyon as potassium chromate. And potassium chromate, um, the chromium in that compound is hexavalent chromium, which means it's the mobile, more toxic form of chromium. Trivalent chromium, which I'll talk about a little bit here, is basically what you find in your multivitamin. It's essentially harmless and it's immobile. It, it really locks up in the environment and, and it's very difficult to move. Um, we did a lot of uh, archival research, going back into records, literally looking at purchase requests from back in the 50s and 60s. We talked to some old timers who were still living in the community who worked at these facilities. And we basically resolved that somewhere between about 31,000 and 72,000 kilograms of chromium were released into the environment during those years. Um, that may seem like a pretty broad range, but given um, how difficult it is sometimes to actually resolve um, kind of uh, inventories of contaminants used, it's actually, we're, we think that's actually a pretty tightly constrained um, range of possible chromium in the environment. We often use the number in our discussions of 58,000 kilograms released as essentially a mean. The reason that's important is that we're trying to, through the investigation, see if we can basically get our arms around roughly 58,000 kilograms of chromium out in the environment. That's how we know that we've kind of sort of found it all sitting out in the environment. Um, in Mortendead Canyon, perchlorate, which is a byproduct of plutonium processing, came through the same facility that you guys have talked a little bit about, the radio liquid wastewater treatment facility, um, and was released into a small tributary to Mortendead Canyon up until about 2002, at which time uh, an upgrade to the facility dramatically improved the treatment for perchlorate and dropped the concentrations released to below four parts per billion. So we kind of used 2002 basically as a termination period for when perchlorate stopped being released. There are not great records for perchlorate from this facility because it really wasn't something important for them to track regulatorily or, or otherwise. So we really don't have kind of a target um, sort of bounding mass out of the environment we're trying to, to track, although our investigations in Morton Bay Canyon um, have led us to feel pretty confident that we do know where the bulk of the perchlorate is. And I'll get into that in just a little bit as well. Is it primarily potassium, or does it have sodium, chlorate? And the perchlorate? Yes. We only see it measured by analytical laboratories as perchlorate. So however it's compounded, we're not real clear. It's less important for us to know that other than it's in a very mobile form. It's very conservative. It moves with the water. So the same way with the chromium. Same way with the chromium. Although we see two forms of chromium, trivalent and hexavalent chromium. Yes. But the laboratory analysis you do on these compounds don't give you the detail of the compound. They just tell you which species it is, which for the purposes of this is all we need to resolve. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is that with the potassium Potassium, the, the radioactivity we would be seeing from potassium is 
see it a little bit in the gross gamma concentrations, but the potassium has a tendency to become retarded along the pathway, so it's not moving with the chromium. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is basically a, a vertical slice now through the bottom of Sandia Canyon. Um, and I just kind of wanted to get, show you this figure because we're going to keep coming back to it a little bit. And there's a few things I want you to see in this figure that we're going to kind of follow through. One is, is for the purposes of tracking these two contaminants we're talking about, chromium and perchlorate, they sort of sit in three reservoirs, if you will. Um, there's a surface reservoir of chromium as trivalent and hexavalent chromium, and you'll see in a minute that we think all the chromium on the surface is essentially the trivalent form. Um, there are PCBs. I wasn't planning to talk a lot about that, but I can certainly um, point to a little bit of the story on that here in just a moment. So that's kind of one reservoir, if you will, of the chromium that we're trying to track. Um, there's no perchlorate in the surface environment at all. There's a reservoir, if you will, of these constituents in what I'll use the term Vado zone, but it's basically the 800 or so feet of complex rock stratigraphy between the surface and the regional water table, which is this one right here. And this is the regional, you'll hear it referred to as a regional aquifer, other terms like that. This is basically the water supply for the county and for um, the laboratory. And one thing to point out here is um, a, a, a substantial simplification of what in fact is incredibly complicated um, geology right vertically in this area. Um, and then the regional aquifer, of course, the hexavalent chromium is present as well as perchlorate. So we're going to kind of keep coming back to this theme um, over and over here in the next handful of slides on our journey through the crazy straw. All right. So again, this is basically the watershed again, and I want to talk just a little bit, not, not a whole lot, because I know most of your interest is probably in the groundwater. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the surface investigation, because it's a really important component, because in this particular case, we think we have good evidence that a fairly large amount of that 58,000 or so kilograms of chromium is still in that surface environment in a very stable form. And you heard Dave Cobrain talking a little bit about um, the wetland and the importance of the wetland, and so this plays into that. These little shaded polygons you see here along the length of Sandia Canyon um, are depictions of the, the, the methodology that we use to characterize and investigate such a long length of canyon. It would be completely cost prohibitive to come in here and try to sample the entire length of a canyon like that, and we've actually developed a method um, that is extremely robust and basically biasing the investigation towards finding the contaminants if they're there. Um, and so what um, these are basically little areas describing investigation areas. And we use the information from each one of these to extrapolate in between investigation areas. And as long as we see patterns that make sense geologically, geomorphically, with our understanding of surface processes, we um, go with the fact that these investigation reaches are in fact representative of the entire length of such a long watershed. Next slide. This is a, an actually a, uh, uh, one of our maps of the Sandia Canyon wetland. Um, it is a uh, fairly large wetland. It's about a half kilometer long. I think it's the second largest uh, wetland we have at the laboratory. It is an effluent supported wetland. Although there is some indication from a little deposit sitting right down in this area right here that this wetland probably existed prior to the laboratory being there. But if you know cattails, just add water and they go crazy. And so we think there was a little uh, sort of incipient wetland down here prior to the laboratory. The laboratory uh, both runoff from developed areas as well as effluent that um, was released into this canyon. Um, and in this case it was sanitary effluent that in fact was the same effluent in part that the chromium mixed with and traveled down canyon, basically caused this wetland to expand substantially. So this is basically the way we approach these investigations is to do very detailed uh, mapping. And I know you can't see all these uh, uh, notes and stuff on here, but basically every place you see some kind of annotation on here, there was something done there. Samples collected, sediments described, screening uh, information pulled. Lots of detail collected from this area. This is a little bit of a photograph of it, and basically what you're looking at here is about 200 meters of canyon length, and this green color right in here is, is cattails. Um, in June, July, it's practically impossible to walk through this area without a, a machete or a knife or something like that to get through. It's a very dense, very robust wetland. 
Um, next slide, please. The investigations that we did in the canyon, not only in the wetland, but in investigation reaches all the way down canyon, lead us to be able to generate um, plots like this, where basically we use distance from the Rio Grande just as kind of a linear reference point for where information is collected. So the Rio would be right down here, and the wetland is actually this spot right in here. And these are concentrations of chromium, uh, both average concentrations and maximum concentrations um, that we see in the different investigation reaches. And the takeaway from a slide like this is basically to see that the maximum chromium we see is in the wetland, the maximum average um, chromium concentrations are also from the wetland and concentrations decrease down canyon. What that tells us is that the wetland was basically the first location that chromium that was released from the power plant, it was the first location that um, the, the water containing chromium encountered. And the dense organic matter and the reducing conditions in a wetland like that see that hexavalent chromium come through and it grabs it and practically instantaneously turns it into trivalent chromium. This is telling us that a whole bunch of that process took place right basically at the beginning of the release. Chromium came out of that outfall, ran through the wetland, turned into trivalent chromium, and then didn't go anywhere. Clearly some of it made it through, and I'll tell you the rest of that. What made it change? The strong reducing conditions that are, were created by the abundance of organic matter. So when you're in a wetland, yes. Okay, next slide please. The other way we take information from these sediment investigations is to look at it in terms of a cumulative inventory. So again, we're trying to figure out where the chromium is, not only all the way to the groundwater, but even within the surface environment. So again, distance from the Rio, cumulative inventory in kilograms. So you can see that we have a, basically this is just a line as you move down canyon, how much inventory do you keep building of chromium? You can look at it as inventory, as total mass, whichever term you feel most comfortable with, we're looking at about 18,000 kilograms of chromium in surface sediments in this canyon floor. That's a lot. 18,000 against that number of 58,000 is, is a mean. So it could be that as much as a third of the total chromium released from that outfall sits in the surface sediments. More important, you can see that you go from zero inventory. So again, this is inventory on this axis. You go from no inventory, essentially, to most of it just in that wetland alone. And you only add a little more inventory as you keep going down canyon. So the point of this is that 15,000 of the 18,000 kilograms of chromium in sediment sits in that wetland, which again makes that wetland very important for managing. Uh, we've done some studies, coming back to your um, question, Bob, we've done some studies of, of chromium to look at speciation, to make sure that the chromium in that wetland really is trivalent chromium and not only in the wetland, but all along the length of the canyon. And we've found from a, a lot of analysis on this that far greater than 99% of the chromium is as trivalent chromium. So this 15,000 or 18,000 kilograms of chromium, we feel is pretty stable. It's pretty locked up in the environment as long as we do the work to manage the sediment from moving. Because the only way this chrome is going to move is if the sediment moves. So this chrome is going to stay stuck to sediment and only move if sediment moves. We've actually done some studies, I didn't go into it here, of um, going out into that wetland and carving out big um, blocks of it and drying it in a, in a laboratory environment to see if taking it out of the reducing environment in the wetland and putting it into an oxidizing environment just through drying could cause the trivalent chromium to revert back to hexavalent chromium. We did quite a bit of work on that with progressive leaching to see if we could drive chromium off we never were able to, and that actually happens to be consistent with a lot of work we've seen in the literature that it takes a, a pretty unique geochemical environment to have trivalent chromium revert back to hexavalent chromium. Do you okay. do EH measurements? Pardon? Do you? Yes, we do. We do pH measurements. One e of the key. EH. We don't do EH measurements. Again, if we started seeing evidence that we were seeing transfer back and forth, we would start in, embarking on those kinds of questions. We're not seeing any evidence at all through surface water that continues to release through the wetland or through our laboratory drying experiments that anything's happening here at all. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm going to kind of start walking you from the surface down to the groundwater. So you're, you're entering the crazy straw now. 
um, the watershed again, and again, I don't expect you to read all these. It was really just to try to impress upon you that every place you see annotation on here, some kind of piece of information was gathered for this investigation. There's wells on here, there's surface water stations, there's, there's a borehole data. This has been a fairly intensive investigation um, over the years that I described over here. Next slide. One of the very first things we needed to do was to try to understand so remember, we already knew when we started the investigation that we have chromium contamination in the groundwater. So this was basically like, um, like you know, back when I was in grad school in geology, we used to use the term that in geology it's different than chemistry. In chemistry, you put things together and you watch things move forward from that. In geology, you see the end of the experiment, and your job is to review, is to kind of uncover how you got to that point. So we started this whole thing back in 2005 with the observation that we already had chromium in the groundwater. So all this investigation is basically trying to figure out how it got there, where it is today, and how it got to the groundwater. So one of the very first things we wanted to do, and this is basically, again, cross-section of slice through Sandia Canyon. This is where the chromium was released from the outfall. Um, and we wanted to basically understand how it gets over to this point in the groundwater over here. And so one of the very first things we needed to do was basically follow the surface water and see where it starts going down vertically. So one of the things we did was install a series of uh, measurement points along the length of the canyon that would let us basically watch um, the volume of water flowing past certain locations to help us understand where you start seeing less water moving and indicating that it must be going downward instead of laterally along the length of the canyon. So we had measurement points everywhere you see a vertical green line on here, and each one of those points represent one of these bars. This is the amount of flow in cubic feet per second through a series of uh, several days um, in uh, November of 2007, basically trying to help us figure out where the flow in the surface really changes. And basically, these, each of these bars, more or less, are roughly equivalent. The black one, as you can see, starts dropping a little bit, and it sits right in this area right here. And then this uh, sort of orange bar right in here is a location about right here. What this tells us is that you don't really lose much surface water all the way along the length of the canyon from where the outfall is all the way down in here until you hit this, thick, this area right in here where it looks like the geology gets just right to start letting water go vertically. And that's what this shows here is that basically by the time you get to a station we call E124 right down in this area right here all the surface expression is essentially lost. It tells us that there's an infiltration window about right there, which is basically the beginning of the crazy straw. Next slide. So what happens to that water as it infiltrates through? Uh, we think that some of it basically stays as hexavalent chromium and just resides in pore spaces down in, the, remember we were calling this the vagal zone, so the regional groundwater is right down here. This is the surface. This is basically the rock layers. You can see the different names for them. The rock layers on the way down. This just happens to be one core that we collected. And this shows basically water that has chromium in it that just basically would rinse out by just shaking the core. Water comes out of that. It has chromium in it at these concentrations. That's hexavalent chromium. And it sits at a not, not particularly high concentrations in this particular borehole, but it's different than background. This bar right over here is how much chromium we were able to leach with deionized water, so basically it's just free water to rinse right out of the core from background rock, not anywhere near the zone of contamination. And you can see there's a difference, so it tells us there's some chromium, as hexavalent chromium, uh, down in this particular borehole. This area over here is looking at chromium that um, must have converted to trivalent chromium on the way down through these rocks. These rocks are loaded with iron which are a great place, like the organics in the wetland, they're a great place for chromium to convert from trivalent, or from hexavalent to trivalent. And so we collected some samples of basalt, which is one of the uh, geologic rock types that you encounter on the way through the Vado zone at this location. And we found some far away from this contaminated site and analyzed it using a, a method different from just rinsing it with DI water, but with a method that actually is intended to sort of take off uh, material that um, might either be inherent to the rock or has contamination stuck on the rock. 
And this bar kind of represents the range of concentrations we found in background uh, basalt for chromium. So basalt is a natural source of chromium. We have a background of chromium at our site. And you can see everything to the right of that is indicative of the fact that there's contaminant chromium also on these rocks. So these rocks are doing a real good job of grabbing chromium that's flowing through there, converting it from, uh, from hexavalent to trivalent, and holding it up in these rocks. So it's one of the other reservoirs, if you will, for some of that 58,000 um, kilograms. Next slide. All right, so uh, crazy straw time again. One thing, this is kind of a little bit of a, a crazy figure, but what I want to show you here is each one of these color bands shown over here on the legend, those are elevations of a certain, uh, uh, they're, they're basically elevations above uh, sea level for the base of that basalt layer that is one of the important layers. If you don't mind, go back um, maybe four slides real quick. No, that one's good. Okay, this basalt layer right here plays really important. It's actually a composite of probably 10 to 15 different lava flows that came out of um, small volcanoes actually on the east side of the Rio Grande. Here's the Rio over here. The, the, um, before the Rio Grande cut, these volcanic centers were over here. They flowed off to the west. And it's shown here as a single kind of amalgam about 300 feet thick, it's probably actually 10 or 15 different lava flows that have all coalesced. You can imagine how complex the layering is within something like that. 300 feet thick, 10 flows coming together, you're going to have complexity. That slide that we're going to go back to now represents the, the orientation of the base of that um, group of lava flows. So go forward, at least right there. So these are basically elevations above mean, mean sea level of the base of that lava flow. And you can see that you're higher above mean sea level here and you're lower over here. The area that we've been talking about where that infiltration occurs is about right in here. And so what's it going to do when it hits that uh, basalt layer? It's going to move south from higher elevations to lower elevations. And all of this is occurring four to 500 feet below ground surface. So water's percolating down. It hits a layer that it wants to start traveling horizontally on because of maybe a contrast in the permeability of the two different rock layers. And at this location, we've determined that it's going to move southward if such a thing were to occur. Next slide. And it's been uh, essentially validated, if you will. This is a cross section now looking, say, to the west. Same, through the same basic area of investigation. Los Alamos Canyon is the canyon to the north. I won't really get into a lot of detail there. Here's Sandia Canyon again. This is just the topography of the landscape. And here's Mortendad Canyon right in here. So basically the infiltration area is right in this area here. You can see that there's water occurrences and we know about these water occurrences. That's what these blue shaded areas through wells that we've drilled and boreholes that we've drilled. So these are all actual elevations of water occurrences that we've encountered and, and mapped essentially in the subsurface. And you can see a southward dip to those. So north would be on your right, south on the left. Um, and you can see a southward dip to those. And we actually think that water is moving vertically, hitting these perching horizons, and then traveling along certain layers to the south. So the Sandia Canyon water that has the chromium goes down, finds itself perched in those um, basalts, which this particular zone right here is sitting on top of the basalt. This one right here is sitting very near the base of the basalt. And you can see the water would move down here and then move laterally. And these, these odd figures on here are a tool that we use to basically fingerprint, if you will, the chemistry of any given monitoring location that we have. So everywhere you see one of these odd shapes here basically means that's a monitoring point, in the, a monitoring well in the subsurface. And we use a series of standardized constituents. This says sodium and potassium. This says chloride. This is bicarbonate, sulfate, etc. And what you do is you basically plot the relative concentrations of each one of these, and it essentially creates a fingerprint of that water. And we use that to actually track where waters look common, and where they look common, you can infer from that that they're along a common flow path. So you can see that the Sandia Canyon water moves down, and there's always going to be some differences in all these, but you can see a common theme here between these right here 
this one right here, and this group right here. And that really represents, that group right there, in a very simple manner, represents the, the crazy straw pathway that chromium took to get from the surface down it perched here, it broke through, it perched on this zone, traveled horizontally, is still probably traveling horizontally at some concentration, breaks through again, finally through the basalt, and enters the regional aquifer, and our uh, sort of the bullseye, if you will, of the chromium plume sits right in the area of these two wells, R28 and R42. Yeah. Yes, Danny. Um, just real quick, you do a great job on the technicality of educating us that are not so informed in, in that regard. But when you say south, do you mean towards Santa Fe? <laughs> um, yes, no. Uh, yes, no. Yes. Um, if, yes. You want to use, if you want to use Santa, Santa Fe as a reference point, right. in the same way that I could say north, meaning the North Pole, Right. yes. Thank you. But if you're asking, could it arrive in Santa Fe? The answer is no. Okay. <clears throat> now, Marsh, Danny, um, is trivalent less harmful than hexavalent, or both of them bad? Or no, the the trivalent chrome. I mean, um, I actually heard something really interesting, and it's a common term used, I think, in science in general. But I heard something just the other day on my drive home on NPR. Um, the, the the what what was the term? The poison is in the dose. Right? So nothing by itself is automatically a poison. It's always about the dose. Trivalent chromium is essentially considered not harmful. Certainly if you dropped a pile of it on your head, it might knock you over or something, but trivalent chromium is what's in your multivitamin in the morning. Hexavalent chromium <coughs> is viewed as potentially harmful. I think it's actually not considered a carcinogen. I'm not an expert in this area. I think it has other effects. Um, it's far more harmful inhaled. I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the regulatory and in the scientific community in terms of how dangerous it actually is to ingest in, in water. But hexavalent chromium is really the one we're talking about here. It's the more the more important from an environmental investigation standpoint. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's a short bit that uh, most activity at the Hill is supervised or governed or whatever by a professional, whether it be a PhD scientist or an engineer. Is it, uh, and they do things like this particular project or uh, infraction. Is anyone ever held accountable for for messing up the the environment, like in this case? You know, uh, th that's probably not really my place to answer, but I'll give you a stab at it. When this happened, there was nothing that was considered um, outside of the regulatory framework at the time. Most of the regulations that we're working to now have evolved since then. I will say that it was impressive when we found um, a lot of the archival materials um, that led us to understand about the chrome release and stuff like that. We actually found memos that said, due to the potential toxicity and hexavalent chromium in the environment, uh, a manager, I, can't, I have no idea what the person's name was, uh, declared that we were going to stop using it and move to another compound as a corrosion inhibitor. So even in 1972, my understanding is that there was no regulation that drove them to stop using it. There was a decision made on someone's part to stop using it. And the other question is, I know for sure that at one time, the TA3 power plant sent uh, over 2,000 gallons of sulfuric acid down that canyon. And we actually monitor sulfate. So what, whatever happened to that? We actually, well, we see sulfate actually was a compound used as a balancing agent back at the time the chromium was used. And we thought we track it. We haven't seen any evidence of sulfuric acid specifically. I'm not sure how it would change in the environment during the pathway. 2,000 gallons um, is such a tiny amount that it probably would be indiscernible in the environment. Okay. You're welcome. Any more? Can I move on? I'm getting fairly close. 